Hi, so I'm Vicky Brown. I'm one of the critical care paramedics from Great Western Air Ambulance. Uh, and I'm Scott Graham, ex-FEM trainee and ex-chairman of FEMTA, which is the FEM Trainees Association, um, and also work for Great Western Air Ambulance. Um, we're going to change the tone a little bit for the next 20 minutes or so um, and talk about FEM trainees in difficulty, part one. Um, there's a second session after us. Um, what we're going to talk about is our experiences, um, which is something quite personal to me, as it will uh, become obvious in a minute, um, but also try and pull out the things that we do in our organisation to support <coughs> trainees um, who go through difficult situations, and actually how we support anyone in our organisation who, do, who does. Um, and the reason we think that's important is because it's become increasingly relevant, not just within the FEM community, but uh, in terms of trainees, but also the wider FEM community, both with some events last year, um, and just generally in terms of well-being of individuals. So uh, to help us tell you what we do, I'm going to tell you a story that's real, it's genuine. I haven't told it in such a public forum before, but I think it's really important to share um, what happened. So a bit of background. Um, unlike the Wales started off in like how many years ago with the Bolco, we were still using this three years ago, so um, we were quite far behind. Um, but um, Great Western Air Ambulance, I started with them in 2013, um, and I was an anaesthetics and intensive care trainee um, at that time. Went through a training process, went through a sign-off process, and that was before FEM, um, but was a trainee with them. And I think my experience is relevant regardless of whether I was in a FEM programme or not at that point. Um, and by the time this job happened, um, I was doing a couple of shifts a month um, as part of the regular team of volunteer doctors um, and working with our CCPs. Um, also relevant is where I was in life, and this is, I think, really important to how we look after people. Simon and Rod have already alluded to the fact that people and our trainees have lives outside of medicine. We all have lives outside of medicine, but they're often at trainee level, settling down, having children and so on. So we had a three-year-old um, and we had a six-week-old baby or so, um, and uh, so life was busy outside work. This is Guy Jordan. Um, so Guy was a consultant anaesthetist in Bristol and also a consultant intensive care physician. Um, and by all intents and purposes was a great bloke, well loved, very enthusiastic about medicine, skiing, uh, cycling and many other things. Um, and was a really larger than life character that an awful lot of people knew, not just within Bristol but also further afield. <coughs> and on the 19th of November... 2013 he was injured so I'm going to tell you the story of what happened that day and what happened afterwards to me and how I was looked after so to set the scene 19th of November cold and sort of dreary day outside um, normal shift for us so seven till seven got in just before seven did our normal kit checks drugs and so on um, and then we were ready to go and we were sent out about quarter to eight I think to Wiltshire for a patient who'd been knocked off their bike um, and it turned out, actually, when we got there, that it sounded very much like they'd had a supper rack and fallen off their bike as opposed to anything else. So we are aside them, took them back to French Aid, um, uh, as it was in, uh, in that time, um, in North Bristol, and then re-kitted and went back again uh, operational by about half past ten. And about 11 o'clock in the morning, we got a strange phone call from the dispatch desk saying, we've got a patient who's been knocked off their bike by a truck. We think they're injured, we don't really know, but there's a HEMS doctor on scene who's asking for you to, to come. Um, so the CCP I was working with that day and I kind of looked at each other and said this is a bit strange because we don't know anyone who lives down that, in that part of um, South Bristol um, and we don't really know what the story is and there genuinely was no more information than that on the CAD or from the call taker. So we said okay well we'll go back on, on the basis and that we'll try and get some more information we can always stand down if it's not as given. Um, so we um, decided to fly down um, and en route got two updates, which were not particularly detailed. The first one said, the patient is seriously injured, they're unconscious, they've been driven over by a truck. Um, and the second update said, the HEMS doctor who's on scene is asking where you are. Um, and that's all we had. So again, we kind of bashed ideas around and said, who is this person? And we rapidly came to the conclusion it's probably someone we didn't know, um, because we couldn't think of anyone it could be. So we landed at the top of a hill and walked down what has uh, subsequently we found out as a road called Horse Race Lane and came down to this location here, which essentially was just a sort of narrow lane where an oil tanker had been driving up very slowly um, and had unfortunately knocked a 
patient off their bike um, and driven over them. When we walked around the tanker, it was really obvious where the patient was. It was lying on the floor, big hive of activity around, as we see very frequently from a pre-hospital point of view. A couple of ROVs, an ambulance, um, and, uh, and a number of people <coughs> attending to the patient. And I remember the first thing I saw was the person at the head end of the patient, me, and I thought, my goodness, I recognise this person. It's a consultant anaesthetist from French Aid. Um, and ironically, that same person I'd done, a, 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 I'd attended a job who they had also been at um, probably about three or four months beforehand. And I thought, that's really unfortunate to have two jobs where this person has just been a bystander. Um, and they'd been one of my trainers. And then I looked around and realised that there were two other consultant anaesthetists uh, and intensive care physicians who also were from French Aid and also were people who trained me and I'd worked with in the last six months or so. And people who I'd done my first novice period of time with in anaesthetic training. So knew really very well. And French Aid was a very friendly, sort of family orientated department in terms of looking after you. Um, so these were people who'd become friends as well as colleagues. So we walked up to, uh, to them, said hello, and um, the consultant who was at the, the head end of the patient kind of looked at me and said, hello, Scott, you know this patient, it's Guy. Um, and I remember looking at the paramedic I was working with, and we looked back at each other and went, oh my goodness, it actually is. And it was the first time, even though we sort of walked to the scene, we'd seen all these people that we knew, that we realised that this was a patient that we knew. And, and I think from my point of view, I embarked on a HEMS career thinking that at some point I would probably be unfortunate enough to treat someone that I knew of or that I knew. I didn't expect that to happen within six or eight months of starting, and I didn't expect it to be quite so spectacular. So we looked at Guy, we got the handover from them, um, he had been driven over by a truck, he was critically ill. And actually looking at him uh, objectively, it looked very unlikely that he would survive the injuries that he had right from that moment. But we worked really closely with the paramedics on scene, with the doctors who were there, um, and RSI him, put him in an ambulance, packaged him, and we were ready to go. <coughs> um, and that was all pretty efficient, actually, because we had lots of people around and everyone was very motivated to get off scene and to get him to hospital. We were about 20 minutes by road from French 8. I remember making a couple of top cover phone calls. The first to say we're going to RSI him and identifying him as a patient to the top cover consultant who was working at French 8 at the time. Excuse me. And also a second phone call um, saying, look, we're pretty much ready to go. Just make sure that people are aware before I do the pre-alert that we're bringing a patient in who is really well known in your hospital. Um, and we got into the ambulance and um, there was myself, uh, our paramedic, and also one of the three doctors who'd been um, uh, out cycling with him. Um, and that was one of our colleagues as a Hems doctor. And he said, right, we just want to make sure that, I, I want to make sure that you're going to do everything correctly. And that's absolutely right, I think, in some ways. But his mindset was obviously very different to mine in terms of he'd been there when this had happened. And also, he was my trainer and I was a trainee, and so that dynamic's quite interesting, quite challenging. Um, it worked really well, however, um, and all we did was just bounce ideas back and forth off each other over the course of the 20-minute journey, make sure that we'd done everything that we could, make sure that he was, that guy was packaged, sorted as much as we possibly could, um, and deliver him to hospital. Um, and we got to hospital, offloaded into Resus 1 at French A, which um, was a sort of old building at the time and, uh, and they were building the new South <laughs> Hospital and I remember walking into Resus and looking for a moment at the number of people uh, expecting us and thinking my goodness I've never seen so many consultants for one patient ever and I'd taken up people previously who were as critically ill as that in and never seen that and been part of trauma teams um, and word had got out they managed to muster everybody that could possibly be relevant to his treatment um, and everyone was sitting waiting we did the handover and then walked away and did some paperwork. And um, that was when you kind of think, actually, I'm not really sure what to process here. Um, and I think we've probably all had situations where we've walked away from jobs and it's just been uh, a blur of activity and focused time and effort. Um, and then a sort of rapid come down where you're back to normal um, and almost trying to reset and recycle and then go on to the next job. And we realised very quickly that we couldn't do that. So we 
talked to each other. We had a quick chat to the, the other three doctors who'd been on scene, quick chat to the road crew, um, and then made our way out to the aircraft. And this is the aircraft that day at Frenche. Um, I've no idea where I took a picture of it, but it's on my phone and it's on that date, so it's on photo stream. Um, and I remember both of us sitting at the aircraft talking to our pilot, who wasn't one of our regular pilots, and saying, this is a big thing. Um, we don't know why it's a big thing other than we know this person and the paramedic I was working with knew Guy as well, um, but we recognised it was a big thing. So the first thing I did when we got back to the aircraft and put our kit away was phoned Phil Coburn, who at the time was one of our, was our medical director, um, and said, Phil, you just should know we've done this, we've been involved in this job, it's very high profile in terms of the medical um, uh, sort of population in Bristol and um, just so you're aware basically. Uh, and if it's all right with you, we're going to take ourselves offline for an hour and just go back to Filson and restock. Um, and he said, yep, yeah, that's fine. Um, I'll talk to you in a bit. Over to you. So I'm just going to kind of go through the support that can be available the day of the incident and sort of thereafter, which Scott will also just chip in for his experience from it. So the actual day an incident happens, um, you have your normal informal chat with your crewmate. Uh, with road crews, if you if you're on a PEMS unit like us, and, and other people that have been kind of involved with the uh, with the treatment of that patient, which is exactly what Scott did. They um, they had a chat with each other. They felt pretty numb after it. Um, they spoke to the other consultants that had been there uh, with Guy, and had a quick chat with the road crews as well. Um, so then, what happens is uh, Scott had obviously spoken to Phil uh, to make him aware. So that chain has started then that senior management are then involved and know that something has happened and this needs to be looked into. So I'm a TRIM practitioner. So for those of you who are not aware of TRIM, it's uh, trauma risk management, pretty much is exactly that, um, of which I'm a manager and a practitioner of. Um, and the initial phase that we start to go through is to start getting the bits together. So we would get a phone call to say, uh, this crew have been to this incident. So we'll start planning to say, right, do they need any extra help? Do we need to then start talking about getting them through initial assessments? Um, or are they fine? So that's our initial first day planning. Um, sometimes if it's a really big incident, there's a lot of people involved, we can do what we, what's called, called a TIB, which is the uh, trim instant briefing, which is really there to put over factual information to stop rumours starting, give some education about what people may or may not start feeling for the next sort of few days so that you don't necessarily need to assess every individual person that could have been involved sort of within that incident, which can also obviously include all your control room staff who are away from the incident but still obviously involved in it. Uh, so that was the initial bit. Um, so your employer has got a duty of care <coughs> uh, to ensure that employees um, are safe and look after their well-being. So as you all know, I mean, day to day and pretty much every day, we're going to incidents that can be pretty unpleasant, pretty challenging for us. Uh, a lot of the time, we just get up, get on to the next one. But the employers have a legal and moral uh, responsibility to look after us, to cope with that everyday role. So at the end of that day, um, or even sort of in the afternoon. So Matt, who's one of our consultants, had come along and had a chat to us, and we'd recognised that this was, as I've said, a big event, but also that we probably shouldn't continue doing what we're doing. Um, we had a late car team in that were due in mid-afternoon, um, and we'd, we agreed by the time they'd got in that actually when they were sorted from a kit and drugs point of view, we would hand over to them and we'd step back and not do any more clinical work. Um, and that was difficult, I think, because we still needed to provide or felt the obligation to provide critical care to other patients while still obviously looking after ourselves. Um, but by mid-afternoon, we'd stepped back from the clinical provision of care and we um, had a bit of time just chatting away um, and talking about it and then said, actually, we'll just go home. And I remember going home um, uh, and it obviously sunsets at kind of four o'clock or something or 4.30 in, in November and thinking... I don't really know what's just happened, but it, this is going to be different. This is going to be big. And by then, a number of phone calls had happened. More phone calls continued to happen throughout the, the early part of the evening as we were putting the kids to bed, and then the latter part of the evening. Text messages from loads of different people. A lot of support, um, but also just updates as to what was going on in hospital with Guy. And by the time I went to bed, um, we 
it was very obvious that he was very, very sick and unlikely to survive the night. Um, so he went to bed, had a disrupted night because the, our youngest was still six weeks old and thus getting up or uh, waking up regularly, which um, I think is relevant to the bigger picture that I'll paint. Um, and got, uh, I was up by half past six and about quarter to seven, seven o'clock, had a phone call from the lead clinician, uh, sorry, the, the, the clinical lead for IT at the at French Aid, so he died overnight. Um, and that phone call on its own didn't really make a big difference to me at the time because it was what I'd been expecting to wake up to in terms of news. Fortunately, the next day was our clinical governance day. So serendipitously, I'd booked the day of leave to attend governance, went in early and started talking to people. Um, and so some of what Vicky's just talked about in terms of that informal debriefing that we do um, that I think I've got much better at over the last few years just because I've done it more. Um, we did. So we sat around, we talked about it, had a, had a few cups of tea, um, and um, then we started our governance day. And Phil, who I've said is our, was our lead at the, clinical lead at the time, started the governance day by saying to the sort of 15, 20 people who were there, most of whom hadn't known that this had happened because it really had happened only sort of 18 hours before, um, describes a, a very sort of brief overview of the event, but also gave a very poignant tribute to Guy because he was well-known, well-liked, as I said. And I, and I remember sitting there at the back just sort of looking at the paramedic I'd been working with thinking, this is really challenging because this is suddenly very personal to an awful lot of people, and yet we've had a very, very personal and very difficult and very different experience of what's happened. Um, but we didn't really know what else to think about it, really, and, um, and spent the rest of the day uh, just doing the normal stuff and then went home. So, Trim. Um, so this began with the Royal Marines, um, but it's now used by many organisations outside of the military. Um, it is nice compliant because it's a peer-delivered traumatic stress management system, so you're also providing your um, duty of care from your employer. It basically is providing um, sort of mental health well-being um, and some education around how you would be feeling. So a lot of feelings you get after an incident are absolutely completely normal. Um, so that helps with the education of that. So people start thinking, oh, this, there must be something wrong with me. This isn't normal, but actually it's completely normal. So we do a lot of education around that side of it. Uh, it's not a therapy. I'm not a counsellor. I'm not a therapist. Um, just have training in how to do an assessment and pick up anything that's just coming through from the individual or from the group uh, so we can then signpost them to some specialist help if needed. Um, so we do that, we do all the planning, decide if people, they don't obviously have to have initial uh, trim assessment, but we offer it to them. Um, this, the actual assessment is done three <coughs> days after minimum from the incident. So we don't do it straight away. Um, there's now there's poor evidence that that actually helps, and actually there's evidence to say that it could actually be damaging to the person if it's done in initially straight away. So we say at least three days, it gives that person time to try and process their thoughts and reactions to what's actually just happened to them. So we can do that with an individual or with a small group. You'll hear that with Scott's case, the initial one was in a small group. Uh, this may or may not work, depending on uh, everybody's what they actually want to get from this assessment. From that one, if anybody's just flagging up they need an extra bit of help, we can then refer them to specialist help within our trust or externally, depending on what's needed. Uh, and then at the end of it, we uh, set a date for a monthly follow-up. So this needs to be a minimum of a month. Um, so we sort of say four to six weeks is a kind of average sort of time. Um, and you will also hear later why we need to do it at least a month afterwards. Uh, so that date's then set, and then people then go away and can start thinking about, start processing the reactions they've got to that incident. So we had our first trim meeting, um, I think day three or day four, I genuinely can't remember which day it was. Um, and I've been involved in trim subsequent to this and had really good experiences, um, but I have to say that meeting wasn't terribly helpful. So... It was attended by myself and the paramedic who uh, I've talked about, one of the other road paramedics who was a heart um, paramedic from across the, uh, the road from us in our base, um, and also those three consultants that I've talked about. 
crucially, we also had two trim practitioners. So our in, one of our internal practitioners, who's one of our other critical care paramedics, had recognised that this probably needed more than one person and also would probably benefit from having someone internal to our organisation and also external to the HEMS outfit, but uh, from the ambulance service. And I think that was really helpful because it gave everyone the opportunity to go to see either of those people beyond that initial meeting. Um, but I didn't find that initial meeting very helpful because it didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. And we had really different agendas in terms of that group of people attending who'd been on scene. So some of the consultants wanted to know what the thought process were, why we did things, why we didn't do things. Um, even though we were all medical, we were looking at things from a very different point of view. Whereas others just wanted to almost criticise what had been ha what had happened or criticise the events that had led up to the, the accident in the first place. Um, and so I have to say I walked away from that feeling certainly no better and possibly even a little bit worse in terms of what had happened. Um, but it seemed to be what was accepted and so that was the end of that meeting. Um, I also took the opportunity that day to speak to my college tutor in hospital so we've talked already about the fact that we've got lots of scheme A and B trainees, uh, or A in particular, who are, who've got another job. Um, and so I flagged that up from a personal point of view to the college tutor in the hospital to say, I've been involved in this, it's really high profile in the region, um, you need to know that I've um, been at scene and I've treated Guy. And they were really good actually, and they phoned me the next day and we had a proper chat for about an hour on the phone and they said, yep, we'll keep an eye on you, anything you need, let us know. So I thought I'd sort of done everything from that point of view. Um, over to you. <coughs> so from that sort of initial assessment time, um, for the next four to six weeks, whenever it is you've managed to get the monthly follow-up planned, is the kind of time when we're just monitoring for any other signs of stress. So that can be crewmates that are monitoring, um, lead managers, I mean, we've obviously got lead CCP, lead doctors, and if anything's just triggering off something or someone's thinking, actually, they're not acting like they normally do, uh, so we just start monitoring it. So it's almost like a sort of watchful waiting period. Um, and you're looking at things, I mean, initially, people can feel guilty, stressed about it. Someone, they, you know, especially in this incident, it's someone that Scott knew very well, had consequently died. But actually, that's all normal reactions to it. It's when it starts to develop a bit more um, and they start to sort of start getting depression, start having uh, flashbacks from it, uh, looking at sort of, sort of phobias about they don't want to go out, um, they don't want to, you know, even seeing a cyclist can trigger something. That's the things we're starting to look for in that month because that's the month that they're starting to process their thoughts of what happened and their reactions to it. So that's just continuing for the whole sort of four to six weeks. Uh, then you have your monthly meeting. So this can also be done individually or in small groups, but it's preferred that it's done individually because obviously everybody's processed all of that at completely different rates. Um, and there's different agendas. And just like the initial one that Scott was saying, everybody had a different agendas in the small group meeting. Um, and also it was for the follow-up is likewise. But I think it's probably more beneficial for an individual meeting so that person can then discuss what they've had from, from the initial assessment uh, meeting right up for this next four to six weeks, however long it's been. Then after that meeting, the person most of the time is fine. They can go carry on doing their normal everyday life. But for the ones that it's not so fine, we can then refer them again on to specialist, uh, specialist help from there on, um, of which there's several different organisations we'll touch on later. And then just uh, you can then do another meeting if you want to, if you want to plan another follow-up. But usually just the two meetings is enough for people. So I had my first, my month follow-up meeting pretty much bang on a month, and it was about the week before Christmas, I think. Um, and um, reflecting on that, uh, and having put this presentation together and also looking back on that period of time, <laughs> our three-month-old or two-month-old had colic, so was screaming from 6pm till midnight pretty much every night of the week. Um, and uh, for those of you who've got children, that's relatively challenging. Um, so... Um, I came to that meeting and the only thing I really remember from it was being asked whether I was drinking more alcohol than I was before. <laughs> um, and I'm sure I was asked loads of other things. And I know that trim practitioner very well and they're a really good friend. And I think they clearly did follow all the questions and ask all those, but I don't remember them. Um, and I remember reassuring that person and myself that I was drinking less alcohol and therefore things were okay. 
Um, and certainly in retrospect, I don't know who I was trying to persuade more that things were okay. They're more me. But either way, both people were reassured that everything was all right. And at the end of the meeting, I was told, right, there's loads of opportunities out there to A, come back if you've got any more problems, and also there's loads of other organisations that can help if necessary. But that was the end of the process from my point of view. That's when it all started to fall apart, I think. And, and actually, it took months, and I really do mean months, so probably four or five months from that moment, so, so certainly five or six months from the time of the event, for it all to fall apart completely. Um, and in that time, not only did we have a baby with colic, I had a wife who was ill and actually was really quite ill for a period of time. Lots of other things going on at work. As I said, no one in my in-hospital work ever really mentioned this again from a sort of pastoral well-being point of view. From a clinical point of view and from an operational point of view within the critical care team, um, there was lots of conversation about it. But again, it's very easy to, to pretend to act. And I think if you all think about your jobs, whatever your jobs are, um, you have a certain ability to act and to deliver that job and to behave as the person that you're expected to be, even when life is not great outside work. And that might be because uh, you've had a bereavement, it might be because there's loads of stress at home, it might be because you're just knackered. Um, but either way, I think we're pretty good at going into work, putting the scrubs on or whatever your uniform is, stethoscope or ID badge around your neck and getting on with it. And I went to work every single day. I didn't miss a single day through illness or through anything else. Um, I didn't miss anything uh, that I wasn't supposed to go to. Um, and I, as far as I know, didn't make any mistakes or wasn't flagged up for anything. The assessments that I had during that period of time were fine. So to all intents and purposes, I was okay on paper. Um, but I really wasn't okay. Uh, I was just really good at acting. And when you go through the kind of symptoms that people have with PTSD and depression and, and in following incidents like this, I exhibited pretty much every single one of those. Um, and uh, I think if my wife hadn't been ill, she would probably have flagged it up earlier. <coughs> but she was not in a good place either. So um, I don't think either of us really recognised how bad things had got. All of our friends didn't recognise any particular changes, even when we talked to them in retrospect. Um, so the reason that and the main reason to come and talk about this experience is because actually I think it really made us realise how many people might be in that situation, but actually they still come to work, they still look like the same person, they're still doing the same stuff, but there's a whole load of other stuff going on in the background. So fast forwarding through to the middle of 2014, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and things really did fall apart and it came to a head with lots of uh, symptoms ranging from anger and mood swings through to really severe um, low mood and feeling that actually just sack everything off and walk away from medicine um, through to all sorts of other things as well. And, and actually that's probably the worst period of time I've ever had in my life in retrospect. Um, but it's very difficult to identify that, that, that at the time and it's very difficult to identify what to do. Um, and it was only when it really came to a head that I kind of said, and we both said to each other, we've got to do something about this because it can't go on. Um, and actually, relatively quickly after that, it started to turn a corner. Um, but it took, I think, initially quite a brave phone call from me to say, you know what, I've got a problem, and going back to that trim practitioner to then plug into um, what support existed. So there's quite a lot of support out there, uh, actually, within your, well, within trusts, I know we've got within ours, um, and also externally. So. A lot of trusts can tap into the Employee Assistance Programme, which is a um, it's an organisation where anybody can ring in. It doesn't have to be work-related. It can be life, any absolutely anything that you can ring up about um, and then start off getting offered the right help from there on, whether that be counselling, some kind of therapy, etc. We have uh, Red Poppy, uh, which is a counselling service within our trust. Um, so we can refer, so tr going through the trim process, you can refer into Red Poppy if you think that person would benefit from some counselling, whether that be CBT or whatever else they're going to offer. Um, but also you can go into that service without having already gone through the trim process. So it's not just you've got to go through trim before you can access them. Obviously, occupational health. Um, and also externally, you've got people like the Samaritans, which you can make a phone call uh, to any time um, and try and get, get the support and the help that you need. So within our service, um, particularly within our ambulance service, we set up a wellbeing um, service which 
uh, includes a mental health nurse, which is uh, really, really good for us, to um, set up this whole service so that everybody can access. Um, doesn't, you don't have to be operational, it can be any staff, uh, paramedic, doctor, um, can access this service, um, which will then also put you through to a trim practitioner if that's what you need, or red poppy, whatever it is that then comes out of your conversation with them and with the mental health people. They then set up a peer supporter group. So we've got uh, peer supporters within the whole of the trust, ranging from literally from cleaning staff right up to senior management so that uh, everybody can go and speak to a peer supporter, whether you want someone that does the same job as you or somebody completely outside of that, uh, about, again, absolutely anything. They're not counsellors, they're not therapists, um, but they can then signpost you on to somebody who can help you. So within our actual unit, uh, we have started doing some training and <coughs> awareness of all of this, not just from Scott's case, um, cause, and Trim was quite new for us then, but also helping any person, not just trainees, but any person that might need some support from the role that we do. So we have clinical governance days that actually completely just address welfare for the staff. Uh, we've had ex-patients come in as well to try and help to deal with that side of things. Um, and we have quite a lot of regular reminders about sort of well-being and looking after each other from our lead CCP. Um, he's very good. He will get phone calls if he know if someone's gone to a particularly difficult job or what's deemed a particularly difficult job. Obviously, that could be anything, and he will then follow that up. Um, not a completely robust system, obviously, because it's only as good as someone that tells him if they've been to a job. But that's a little bit like our trim practitioners as well. We don't always get to hear about the job, so we probably need to make that a little bit more robust. Um, but he will usually give us a bow, just to make sure, touch base, make sure we're okay, if there's anything else that he can uh, forward us on to. So, while we're just finishing this up, what I want you to all do is think about the services that you work in and whether or not you have those systems, whether or not you access them, uh, if you do access them, how you access them, and also, most importantly, what the culture and attitudes in your services are. So I think the biggest thing that's changed in ours in the last three or four years is culture. So within the whole ambulance service, Trim has, ch uh, has changed the culture of how people access support, um, but also has made people talk about it. It's not um, the, the sort of thing that was brushed under the carpet pre maybe previously. Um, and because there are num a huge number of people who've now been through a Trim process and largely have had a positive experience, it's not... A negative thing anymore. Um, I think within our service, as Vicky said, we've got the, 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 the more formal approach and we've changed people's opinions and attitudes by, by openly, openly discussing it. So we've run, as she said, a whole clinical governance day about well-being, about mental health, about what patients see and what we see and why it's difficult. Um, and, and I think we've now got to a, set, uh, to a stage where we're far from perfect, but most of the group understand that actually we're all at risk um, and that we've all got the potential to run into difficulty. And it might not be an incident anything like as high profile as the one I've described. It might just be that individual trigger for, for that individual person. Um, and the bottom line is that because we work together and we recognise that everyone's susceptible, we also recognise that we've got responsibility to look after each other. Um, and every single member of our unit, through from all our CCPs through our doctors and our pilots, um, have a responsibility to look, e look after each other. And we've extended that a bit further to make sure that actually if we're talking about stuff that we're not involving a random observer or a charity member or someone that might be affected by some of the things that we describe. So it, that whole change in culture has taken a few years, but I think is incredibly positive. So over the last half an hour or so, that's just describing what we do. Um, as I said, it's not perfect, um, and we will continue to evolve as we experience more of these um, incidents, but also as we get more wise to what other organisations do. Um, and also as the systems improve and the methods of referral improve, and the number of um, resources that are out there improve as well. Um, the bottom line is we care, um, and I know that sounds really corny because we're supposed to be sort of pre-hospital and macho and all those things that everyone external to pre-hospital care think we are. But actually, this is probably the most difficult aspect of all the professional jobs that we all have, um, and it's the thing that we, we talk about perhaps least. 
Um, for reference for um, this presentation and beyond, there are methods of getting help that are outside your am the ambulance service um, that we all work in. Um, the, the Mind Blue Light campaign has been really pushed in the last couple of years um, and is freely accessible to anybody uh, who's part of the emergency services. Um, and the other organisations mentioned there all have different um, uh, services that they can offer to individuals who've been involved in certain um, events like this. Thank you very much. <laughs>